starting your day right. <laughs> Tell you what, we'll set that up there while I move the cord again. It's always challenging when you're improvising. And you're not one of those professional type ministries that, God bless them, I'm glad they're there, here, wherever they are. Because <laughs> I benefit from them, don't you? I know I enjoy them. But for what I do, I'm glad that God didn't make us and create us to have to, you know, perform a set ritual that we have to dive in, step three times forward, step to the right, step to the left, step back a few, step forward, you know, make sure that we've got, you know, our keep on and make sure we, you know, have our talis and you know, we do our thing. You know, or if you're Catholic, you put on your robes of righteousness, you know, and you adorn yourself in Latin and, you know, ascribe to, you know, doing the fathers and the mothers and all the other godlers, <laughs> all the other articulations of faith that you exercise. But rather, when I don't feel like and I'm laying in bed, I can talk to God just like that, and he's still just as holy to me as he is to you. If you are Catholic or Jewish and you're Orthodox. Because God knows in the times of holiness, oh, I'm there. In the times of worship, I'm there. In the times of rejoicing, hey, I'm there. And in the times of just being real, I'd rather be. So sometimes it's just good to be me. And it's good to be you. And it's good to just be with our God. And today, it's good to be out of the heat. Or the sunshine, anyways. Speaking of sunshine, it's only 94 on my porch. Oi. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Where is the air conditioning? That's why God said he meets you in the cool of the day. He's not dumb enough to come out in the heat of the day. <laughs> Recognize your calling. That is why I remind you to stir up, rekindle the embers of, fan the flames of, and keep burning the gracious gift of God, the inner fire that is in you. 2 Timothy 1.6 Before I knew I was called to preach, I would privately re-preach entire sermons I had just heard thinking, I would have said this and I would have said that or done that. Then I would think, women don't preach. Must be Joyce Myers. <laughs> if you are called to do something, you will get stirred up in the presence of someone operating in the same anointing. For example, if you have an anointing to lead worship or to do special music, you will probably get more excited about the music than the sermon being preached. When in doubt, ask God to make clear your calling. Boy, there's a lot not said in all of that. That's really interesting the big gaps that are not being spoken inside of that one. And I don't mean about women preaching. I don't care women preach or teach or whatever they do. You know, I'm just blessed that they do. You know, if a woman of God is chosen by God and directed by God and God speaks through them, I don't care. You know? If a woman of God wants to be compared to a donkey like a man of God is compared to a donkey, then Balaam, you know, was smart enough to listen to the donkey, so guess what? <laughs> he can listen to anybody. And children are going to lead us at some point in time, and I've seen children lead me in ways that I never imagined, so I don't have a problem with women teaching or preaching or sharing or caring or daring or whatever it is that they do, because guess what? When you're raising children, you're teaching. <laughs> Train up a child in the way that you go. When they're old, they will not depart. But, you know, I laugh at this calling thing, you know, about make your calling and election sure. What's your calling? What's your gifting? What are you doing? You know? How about just being, you know? How about just being you? You know, I've I've worked in so many different ministries and every time I'm in some other ministry, you know, I get in this happens every time too. This doesn't this doesn't happen only once in a blue moon. This happens every time. When you have a personality like mine, people can't identify with the fact that I'm a shy person and had been, and I had to train myself to not be shy, or that I was an insecure person, because now they don't see any insecurity, 
or that I was a tender person, because now they only think that I'm rough and tough. <laughs> They're right. Yeah, dream on. But whenever I got into a ministry, they always tried to make me into something I'm not. I remember when I walk into a church, you know, oh, well, hey, we need volunteers. You know, you want to do Sunday school? I mean, how many times have you heard that? Let's get real. Every time you go to a new church, somebody somewhere at some point in time is going to say, hey, you want to be in Sunday school? And I'm going to say, no, I don't. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to be there. You know, if God teaches me and God preaches to me and God prepares me and God anoints me and God appoints me, then I would go there. But you know what? No. What, you, what I am is what I am and that's what I do. And that's what you do. So if you're a Sunday school teacher, praise the Lord, that's awesome. You know, I met some people that were dynamic. A couple named Lynn and Reed, you know, that were definitely anointed. And wherever they went, they brought Sunday school with them. Believe me, I mean, every waking moment of their life was Sunday school. I mean, it was awesome. I mean, I would watch this couple in action, and they went from the most organized, huge mega church to the most disorganized, most unstructured mess of a church, you know, that you could imagine, and brought the same anointing, the same dynamic ministry, the same capability, the same exact ability to it, and it blossomed under them, with them. That's what a person who's calling is, is when they're doing what they're supposed to do with what they know to do. And they do it, no matter where they are. That's what a calling is. When you can't do anything else, and it's natural. But you know, I was called at different times by different pastors and preachers and teachers to, could you teach this? Nope. Could you do this? Nope. Could you do this? No. Now, have I done all this? Oh, yeah. At some point in time, you know, I've been deacon, an elder, a preacher, a pastor, a teacher, a reader, you know, whatever, candlestick maker, baker, toilet bowl maker, toilet bowl cleaner, whatever. But was that needed at a momentary capability that the Holy Spirit gave me the ability to do for a short period of time, or was it a calling? Really, I wish we could throw the word calling out, except for it's written in scripture. But what God calls you to do is to be with him. And if you're with him, then whatever you do technically will prosper. So anything you really do is, you know, you're going to have some ability to do. But there are some ways and some things that you can do naturally and enjoy. Like sitting here on a porch deck. Drinking coffee. Sharing Jesus. Not letting others make me into being a missionary or being a pastor, or being a teacher, or being a prophet, or being an elder, or being a deacon. You know, if you become those things and God appointed you, praise the Lord. But if you are one of those things and man appointed you, why don't you walk away? Go be what God tells you to do. You know, because men, especially in leadership, love to try to make people into something they need rather than with God, something that God has bled and died to create you to be, which may be unique and distinctive. Just because there's a need doesn't mean you're the one to fulfill it. You need to be who God intended you to be and walk with Him each day to find that out. Because otherwise, you may frustrate the purposes of God. I've seen so many worship leaders that aren't. I've seen so many pastors that think they can worship. I've seen so many worship leaders that think they can sing. I see so many people think that they can do something because they think that it has to be done. When in reality, maybe God doesn't want it done. Because anybody else walking in would go, you, you, you mean to tell me that God anointed you to do this? God appointed you to do this? Okay. Yeah. I hope you learn it. And there's a certain amount of truth to training and learning and, you know, gradually growing, but hey, you know, me personally, people would ask me, are you a pastor? And I'd say, no, are you kidding? Are you a deacon? No, are you kidding? Are you not? No, are you kidding? And even to this day, you know, people want to put titles or perspectives or names or give assigned positions. And I say, uh-uh, not me, man. The only thing I ever, <laughs> what Jesus calls me is one thing. What people call me is another. And I like what Jesus calls me. And I ain't telling you. <laughs> but. 
The only thing I ever title I ever picked for myself was a Jesus Gypsy, because like a gypsy I am and like a gypsy I'll be. When the wind bloweth with her will, you neither know where it's coming from nor where it's going, so too Michael goes, because as the spirit knows wherever it's going, I want to be. And that was me. <laughs> so yes, I like to talk about Jesus. I like to be a gypsy, though. My wandering days seem to be less as wandering, but I am just passing through, so perhaps I still am a gypsy true. And I do have a mentality of one in a lot of ways, that not the negative side that most people think, but the culture that goes along with gypsies. I even helped one day in Jerusalem to get the gypsies recognized as uh, indigent people in Jerusalem. But what God calls you to be and wants you to be is you, and what you decide to do with that, and he decides to put you in, is between you and him. Make sure, as Paul said, to make that calling and election confirmed. That is the point. That is the reason. That's why we do what we do in our devotionals each day. Because if something's not fitting right, don't wear it.